growing your own food, it comes dirty, it comes with bugs, it comes with bird poop. You don't get that at a grocery store. They take care of all that for you. So a little scrub brush is a really good kitchen tool. The interesting thing is when you go to a grocery store and buy Jerusalem artichokes, you don't buy pieces that look like this, that have long stems. You buy artichokes that look like this. When you buy food from a grocery store, you're paying somebody to wash this particular vegetable, but you're also paying somebody more money than you need to because they're gonna cut this piece off and they're only going to sell this piece to you. But here's the thing, all these bits and pieces, this is food, this is edible food that you can eat this raw, you can grate it, ferment it, you can cook it, you can make a cream of Jerusalem artichoke soup. There's so many things you can add it to soups and stews. You can slice it and make scalloped artichokes instead of scalloped potatoes. What you can do with an, a Jerusalem artichoke is limited to your creativity. When you are buying food from the grocery store, it's going to be clean, It's going. you're going to be paying for perfection as opposed to imperfection, and you're paying a price for that. The idea of self-reliance, which I hear a lot of people talking about self-reliance these days, we all need products and services. Self-reliance is about how much goods and services you provide for yourself versus what you allow other people to provide for you. If I'm able to grow my own, the bulk of my own food, and all I need to do is buy seeds the first time, I'm still dependent on somebody for those seeds. But once I've grown something and I have the seeds, or in this case, the bulb or the root, I don't need to pay for that good or that product. And no longer do I need to go to the grocery store and pay for the service of somebody to wash it and package it, etc. for me. And I don't even have to pay for gas to go to the store to buy it because it's right here at home. I don't have to pay for water, I just need to pay for the product, the rain barrel that I collect my water in. So self-reliance isn't so much about being completely independent. No person on this planet is ever going to be completely independent. We all need each other. The thing is, it's about being more reliant on yourself than on other people. I can hem and mend and sew certain things, but I still need fabric. I don't make my own fabric. I can decorate my own house, but I still need somebody to build it. In that, the builders need people to cut the trees down and create the slabs of wood and to create the tiles and you know, it goes on and on and on, right? It all comes down to your skills and your skills are the result of your willingness to learn and to try something and to let go of your need for perfection. This is not perfect, but this is going to keep me alive and if I ferment it will help me thrive. So you have to get your mind out of this whole concept of perfection, which I think pretty much our today's society is definitely geared towards perfection. That's why we all feel so inadequate because we don't measure up to perfection, right? Do you think this little Jerusalem artichoke is having a inferiority complex because it's not perfect? <laughs> I don't think so. According to this little Jerusalem artichoke, it is perfect because it's producing ample food. Another way that you can eat these, if you are on a low carb diet, anything that's a low carb, whether it's ketogenic or otherwise, and you don't eat potatoes, or as I like to say, potatoes, you can use this as a potato substitute. So lots of things you can do with these artichokes. If you're wondering why you would ferment this sunchoke, if you're on a low carb diet, this is rich in sugar. So by fermenting it, you ferment out the sugar. And part of the reason why I don't want to cook these first is because they are edible raw and you preserve the bulk of the nutrients. And because fermentation increases the amount of nutrients that are in food, 
and sometimes creates vitamins and minerals that aren't naturally inherent in a food. It's the best way to get the most nutrients from your food as possible. By the way, I do not peel these or remove the skin before I ferment them. I keep that on, just make sure they're well washed. I have my grated sunchokes and now I just want to add some sea salt. For this amount, I will add approximately three tablespoons. This is a one gallon jar. Other things that you can add to sunchokes if you're fermenting, especially if you're fermenting just to eat as a side dish or if you want to make a soup with it, you can add, am I clear there? There. You can add carrots to this you can uh, and I would grate them I'd keep the same consistency I have a video where I added black radish to this you can add parsnips carrots potatoes beets any sort of complementary root vegetable would go lovely with this today however I'm creating nothing but sun chokes and I have my salt in there and I'm just making a pure salt water brine. If you want to speed this process up, by all means add a starter, whether that's water kefir, milk kefir whey, rejuvalac, or a kraut juice or some other juice from one of your other fermented vegetables. I'm simply going to add water and all I'm going to do is fill it up. I don't need anything on top. I don't need a weight to weigh it down. Some pieces will float on the top. That's not a concern. You just want to make sure that you don't have anything on the rim that will get moldy. You want to keep it all in contact with the salt water. Salt is what is going to inhibit the growth of the bad bacteria while creating a favorable environment for the good bacteria to proliferate and begin to consume the sugars and produce probiotics. I already know for a fact I probably have too much in here because I know that there's a lot of sugar in sunchokes and because of that it's going to swell up and seep over. So because I know that I'm going to transfer some of this into a second jar so that I don't have spillage. Otherwise I'll have to keep something underneath it to catch that overflow and then it's just like I'm constantly cleaning up messes. I don't want to do that today. So I'm just going to take some of this out. And put it in a second jar. There's certain vegetables that you just need to leave a lot more headspace. The more sugar that the vegetable innately has, the more headspace you need to leave. That should be good enough. And now I'm just going to add a little extra salt to both of these jars. and cover them up. Perfect. When you make a fermented soup from any of your fermented vegetables, my suggestion is to use a bone broth of or vegetable broth of your choosing as the foundation. And so heat that up first. Once it's warm, you'll remove it from the stove top and you will add some of this liquid as well as the sunchoke or whatever vegetable it is. Then either transfer that into a Vitamix or some sort of food processor or blender to puree it or use an immersion blender and then quickly transfer it into a bowl. I know a lot of you are going to say but the the food processor, the blender, the immersion blender, it's metal. And you always advocate to us not to use metal. That's true, I do. 
Uh, however, if it's going to come into contact with metal or plastic ever so briefly, it's okay. It's just you don't want it to be in perpetual contact with metal or plastic because even stainless steel contains aluminum and fermentation has the ability to leach chemicals from stainless steel and plastic. And even if it's BPA free plastic, there's still all sorts of other chemicals in plastic. That's why I'm a huge advocate to use glass and wood first and foremost and or silicone. Things that it cannot leach in the same way that it does metal and or plastic. Some of you will say but it's going to leach from the glass. There, there might be truth to that. There's a whole lot less chemical, harmful chemicals in glass. All I want to do is put a lid on this. I'll leave this on my counter for a couple days just so I can keep an eye on it and make sure it's not going to bubble over. And then once I see that it's beginning to ferment and it's not bubbling over, most likely I'll just transfer these into my back room. I have an oven proof anchor glass container and I'm simply going to add some homemade ghee to the bottom a teaspoon and I think what I'm going to do is just so that the butter will incorporate through the whole thing I'm going to smear that ghee all through there or as many of you would call it, greasing the container. And then I'm simply going to add the artichoke whole and bake them. So I'll bake them in the convection oven at, let's say 350 for about 20 minutes. I think I want to add some garlic to that as well. this out while it's still cool not too hot to touch sprinkle the garlic on top but then I think I'm going to add a little bit of salt and put that back in the oven to cook so they baked for about 20 minutes at 350 degrees I've just sprinkled some cheddar and mozzarella on top and now I'll just broil it for a couple minutes sounds crackling Looks amazing. Now, let's see how it tastes. Soft. Hot. <laughs> That's actually quite good. However, for this particular way that I baked it and then put the cheese over and broiled it, it might have actually been better to peel that skin off. It's interesting. It almost has the exact same taste and texture as a potato, except the skin's a little bit, I almost want to say leathery when it's been baked. These would probably be better steamed and then put the cheese over top and melt it. But overall, pretty good. I suspect these would be really, really good if they were mashed. So steamed and or boiled and then mashed. But even this way, they're still really good. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Thanks for watching. Till I see you in a future video. Ciao for now.